can you hear me? I'm here fighting, pressing to remember what you said. But this onslaught of thoughts fills my head with dread and I need you. Like enemies encamped, shrouded in the dark, I can feel the fascination of too many temptations reaching for my heart. So I need you to hear me. For I know your ears are attentive to the righteous, and I know that your ways are certain. Even when my worries would trample me to dust, still, I know you are good. Your hand is just. So come now, be the salvation for my sins. Help me to begin again that you would mend this trend of hopelessness. God, deliver me in my brokenness. I can feel your presence, even now in the ugly, in the mess that has been made. You surround me with your benevolence. Yes, your love is on display, and I can see it. Carving roads through the struggles and the troubles past temptations and devices that seek to choke me out. So come fear, come failure, come opposition or doubt. Jesus, you are my deliverance. Your grace is sufficient. Trusting you is my only way out. Now I turn my mind to dwell on your truth. Curate the condition of my heart to manifest joy. Be my living proof. Subdue the haters, quell the voices inside, transform me, Lord, extinguish my pride. You've won the battle, I trust in your plans. Yes, God, I surrender all my worries, my woes, and my demands into your eternally capable hands. So glad you joined us today as we continue to look at how we overcome in our struggle. And I love, uh, I love that presentation because it talks about the battle that we talked about last week. It's a battle to follow Jesus. It really is a struggle. And here's the good news. Our battle becomes Christ's battle when we're in Him. And you know what? Jesus always wins. He always wins. And so we have victory in Christ. So last week we were in chapter 7. This week we're in chapter 8. And for those of you who are joining us online, we are glad that you're paying attention and engaging with us. Open up your Bibles to chapter 8. We'll be reading off the screen. If you want to open up your Bibles, that's fine. Chapter 8 begins with some precious words. There is no condemnation. And then chapter 8 ends with these words, there is no more separation. No wonder chapter 8 becomes one of the most favorite chapters of Christians throughout, uh, throughout time. And so I, I'm so encouraged that you have joined us in this adventure in following Jesus, and we are diving into the deep end of theology when we read the book of Romans. So starting in verse 1 of chapter 8. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to Him, the power of the life-giving Spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent His own Son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving us His Son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us, who no longer follow sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. I'm going to interrupt this reading because I just need to make a few comments before we finish out the reading today. And that is, remember what Paul is doing here, he's responding to what he wrote in chapter 7. 
So now, or therefore, some of your translations might say. And in chapter 7, Paul cries out to God, O wretched man that I am, who will free me from this body of death? And so we might expect Paul to begin Romans chapter 8 with something like, you bunch of knucklehead sinners, can't you get it right? I mean, when we sang that song today, Good, Good Father, I contemplated during my time of communion, like, and I know I shouldn't do this, but like, I'm not a good, good father. At times, I'm a failure father. At times, I've been judgmental towards my kids. At times, I've been discouraging. At times, I've said things that I wished I would not have said, but we serve a good father. And so, so there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. God is not ticked off with us. God is encouraging us, even though we still struggle with sin in our flesh. And so even though the sin lives in us uh, and, and we hate it, God is still ready to free us and not condemn us. Uh, in this passage that we just read, we recognize that the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ has given us victory, victory over what once held us in prison. And so we are justified just as if we've never sinned. Let's continue to read. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by, by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws. And it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of the sinful nature cannot please God. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, He will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. This is God's most powerful word. And I love this chapter. This is one of my go-to chapters when I'm feeling like I have failed. And I hope this chapter encourages you. But we're not going to get to all of it today. But let's begin with this. No condemnation for all in Christ Jesus. So there's three words. Just want to give a real short definition to so that everybody has some understanding of what we're talking about. Condemnation means to be declared guilty for punishment. Justification means the absence of sin's penalty, just as if you've never sinned. And sanctification means the freedom from sin's power. So you and I, when it comes to sanctification, we, consecra we consecrate ourselves to God. We commit ourselves to following God. And then the Holy Spirit does this transforming work within us, creating, us, creating Jesus uh, within us, making us look more like Him and talk more like Him. Now, this is the Holy Spirit's work. Matter of fact, Romans chapter 8 is this massive understanding of what the Holy Spirit does in believers. And if we think about what Jesus said in John 16, 8, we understand that the Holy Spirit is working on the entire world. Jesus says on the night before he dies, he says, when he comes, meaning he, the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes, the Holy Spirit will convict the world of its sin and convict the, Holy, uh, convict the world of God's righteousness and Convict the world of the coming judgment. The Holy Spirit is working on every human that's ever lived. 
to convince them of three things. Number one, sin has wrecked their lives, as if we needed some understanding on that, right? Number two, that God has brought righteousness into the world through His Son. And number three, there's a judgment day. There's a day that we every person will stand before the Lord God. So the Holy Spirit is convicting the world. Now, I don't have to convince you of the fact that the Holy Spirit is, conv- is convicting your conscience of your sin. As a matter of fact, I don't know if it's true for you, but it's true for me. We have a hard time getting past our past. Can anybody say amen? Anybody tracking with me? How many times did we bring up these old things that happened to us, these old things that we have done? And so we, we are often convicted over and over again of our wrongdoings, and that's part of the Holy Spirit's work. Not too many years ago, there was a, a man in Kentucky who had, who had uh, killed someone and gotten away with it. But the Holy Spirit kept convicting him of him of his sin, and he went and confessed and turned himself in and went to prison for his crime. The Holy Spirit is working on people's conscience to convict them of sin and God's righteousness and the coming judgment. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know if you've heard about this fund, but the U.S. Department of Treasury has what they call the Conscience Fund. It was created in 1811. It was to give people an opportunity to pay back taxes that they had uh, uh, had had stolen from the government, if if that's if you can see it that way. I mean, you know. So these were this is a place to give voluntary contributions for back taxes. In 1811, it received five dollars. All right, people are really convicted. <laughs> but in time, over six million dollars has been given to the conscience fund. Sometimes people will send a note in with their back taxes. And one such note read, uh, it, it, it was just, it, just hilarious to me. It said, here's $100 of taxes I owe you, meaning the government. If I still can't sleep, I'll send you the rest. <laughs> right? So he's just trying to measure out. I, I don't know, it's pretty creative. The Holy Spirit convicts us of wrongdoing, but the Holy Spirit also is convicting us of the righteousness that we have received by faith in Christ. And so it's so important that we understand that Satan will use shame to keep us imprisoned. He loves to beat us up with our past. Sometimes we have a hard time getting past our past. And and he wants to he wants to hold us hostage. But I'm reminded of 1 John 4:4, 4, 4, the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit in the world, meaning Satan. That the Holy Spirit living in us gives us the ability to push Satan and his lies out of our head. And and, and so the next time Satan reminds you of your past, you remind him of his future, right? You let him know, I'm a child of God, and you're not going to control me. We, We really have to understand how powerful the Spirit is within us. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus has defeated Satan for all time. And you and I have to come to an understanding and really believe that victory. There's a story that illustrates this that is just memorable to me. Uh, A family was going on vacation, mom and dad, son sitting in the back of the station wagon. And this is back in the days of 455 air conditioning in cars. You all remember that, right? Yeah, four windows down, 55 miles an hour. Remember that? I remember that. And <clears throat> there, yeah, believe it or not, young folks, there was a day when you didn't have Bluetooth and radio and air conditioning. It was roll down the window if you could get the crank to turn. Remember that? Are anybody tracking me? Yeah. So anyway, they're going down the road, and a bee flies into the cabin of the, of the uh, station wagon. And the boy in the back begins to go berserk. He's screaming, he's hollering, he's terrified. Because you see, it was but a few months ago, this boy almost died of a bee sting. He was highly allergic. And so the father, as all great dads can do, steers with the left hand, and with the right hand, he snags the bee in his hand. Captures the hand, right? Dads can do this. And <clears throat> his, his wife and his son are, are watching him, and he, he holds it tightly, and he grimaces a little bit. 
And then he opens his hand up and the bee flies away. And the son begins to go berserk again because he's terrified that, uh, of that bee. And, and, and his father turns his hand towards the son and says, son, it's okay. I've taken the sting. And he could see the stinger in his hand. All he can do, son, is buzz around and bother you. If you're in Christ, all Satan can do to you is buzz around and bother you. You and I have been given a victory. We are victorious in Christ. Next, allow the Holy Spirit to reorientate our minds upon the person and the purpose of Jesus. I mean, the Holy Spirit is like when you're going down the highway at night and you see a a sign and there's lights shining up on that sign. The Holy Spirit is that light, that light that illuminates the sign. And the sign is Jesus. And the Holy Spirit is constantly trying to get us to focus upon Christ, trying to reorientate our mind uh, and thinking around the person and the purpose of Jesus. And this isn't easy to do because we're inundated in this world with all kinds of information and alarms going off, trying to gather our attention away from Jesus. It's not easy. One theologian, Barclay, writes, to allow the things of this world to completely dominate life is self-extinction spiritual suicide. All Satan has to do is continue to bother us so much that we're constantly distracted and we will not find the victory that we can find in Christ. If we feed our sinful nature, uh, we will not live. But if we feed the Spirit, we will really live. I was telling Casey before his baptism about who I was just briefly, but in Jesus and how my life changed when I gave my life to Christ. I mean, really live in Christ. It's not easy. As a matter of fact, it was far easier not living for Christ, at least at that time. But sin has a way of compounding the cumulative effect, right, of sin, and then it begins to weigh on us. And the longer we live in sin and outside of Christ, then we're crushed by the, 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 the consequences of our choices. And so, anyway, when we are facing problems in this life, in our life with Jesus, first, ask for help. The Holy Spirit is right there in us, around us, wanting to help us. But you must humble yourself and ask. We do. We need to ask Him for help. Look for ways of centering your mind upon godly things. So, as a a newly converted parent, we had this Bible story book, Eager Myers Bible Stories. And I would sit down there and read with my daughters. We even had cassette tapes. Another 455 air conditioning moment. We even had these tapes, and we would listen to the, these stories. And I was like, man, I am learning all kinds of things about God's Word by reading these stories to my Bible. Get involved in where God is moving. We're getting ready to begin a new camp season at Camp Pitt. And there's all types of opportunities for people to be involved in mentoring young minds. Uh, take, take time to involve yourself where God is working and understand the purpose of Jesus in this world. is to turn people away from hell and turn them towards Him and salvation in heaven. Uh, when, when you're facing debt in your life, don't turn to the plastic. Like It's what I did, like... Uh, car needs a new transmission, swipe the card. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's ask God for help. Who knows what God might raise up in our lives and give us help when we need it. Ask Him when you're in financial uh, difficulties. Um, and remember that when we invite the Holy Spirit into our lives, there is a change that goes on inside of us. It's not business as usual. Tim Keller tells a story about when his grandmother uh, when he was a child, his grandmother was uh, going, to come, going to come live with them. And his mom and dad sat him down and said, son, you know, grandma's going to come live with us. Well, he was excited because he loved his grandma. And, you know, grandparents tend to do fun things like give things to their kids and, 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 and bless them in many ways. And so he's excited about that. But when she moved in, it was different than going to visit her. Because when she moved in, she lived in the room beside their living room. And there were things that changed forever while she was with them. There were certain things that couldn't be on, like the television after 11 o'clock at night. Or there, were, there, there was a quiet time. There, there, there was this intimacy that they had with grandmother that, that was different than before. 
and, and their lives began to be, their lives were changed because she was now with them 24-7. And so what is with us? I mean, there's going to be some deep conviction about the way we used to talk and walk and act that we're for like, oh, wait a minute, I'm feeling, I'm feeling a nudge here. I, okay, I'm going to keep my mouth shut right now. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go apologize. You know, there's, there's a change because we, because he is living within us intimately and changing our lives. Remember, if you think upon Jesus, it will change you. Proverbs 23, 7. As you think, so you are. As you think, so you are. So what you think upon will work its way out into how you live. Think about Jesus. The Spirit joins us to gradually drive sin out of our lives. Deuteronomy 7.22, let me read it first. The Lord God will drive out these nations before you little by little. You will not be allowed to eliminate all of them at once or the wild animals will multiply around you. This verse corresponds to the Holy Spirit's work in the Old Testament. When the Holy Spirit was going before God's people, the nation of Israel, and they were going into the promised land, Canaan land, and this, this land was inhabited by all types of Ites, Canaanites and Hivites and Jebusites. And whenever there's an ite, it usually means trouble. And so the Holy Spirit is going in before them and they would conquer a piece of territory at a time. They weren't given all the territory at one time because, as the scripture said, if there's a vacuum, it will be filled with wild animals. And that's how it is with us. The Holy Spirit is gradually driving sin out of our lives. And as, as we push out some bad habit or worthless thing that we're doing, we're incorporating a new piece of God's kingdom in our world. So maybe it's being involved in, like I said, mentioned camp before, or maybe we're involving ourselves into a, a men's Bible study or a, you know some kind of small group, or we're involved in some type of uh, of of, of uh, outreach event in our community, like so, as we push out the old selfish me, the spirit is is leading us to fill that vacuum full of godly things, and so it's important that we recognize that that it's not going to happen all at once. We're not going to change all at once. We're going to change a piece at a time and gradually fill this new space in our life with godly things. Now. That doesn't mean you're off the hook or I'm off the hook in this sanctification process. Let me just mention to you, Jesus says in Matthew 5, 29, tear it out and throw it away. If your eye offends you, your hand offends you, not literally, but figuratively, we're to take decisive action to get sin out of our lives. So pour it out, throw the bag away. Build accountability software into your PC so people see on your screen what your other, you have other accountability friends that are seeing what's on your screen to help you maybe break the, uh, the, the porn addiction. Uh, I mean, uh, there used to be this cuss jar, right? Remember the cuss jar? Anybody have a cuss jar in their house? Anybody, right? You're trying to change how you talk. And you had a jar, jar in there. When you cuss, said a bad word, you throw a dollar in there. And, you know, one long for we bought a new car. No, I'm just joking. But you get it, right? I mean, take some decisive action. Sometimes when we can see it, we're more convicted about changing whatever is wrong in our life. And then learn to be accountable with someone you trust. One person said, we're only as sick as our secrets. If you're hiding... If you're hiding sin in your life, it will eat you alive. The longer you walk with Jesus, the more, the more convicted you will be, and you will not experience the new life if you're just hiding your sin. You're only sick as your secrets. And so learn to be accountable. I mean, this overcoming in small steps is talked about in a study that we're doing, Core 52 on Wednesday nights. And Mark Moore says or writes in this book, that we're studying, he says, we believe our deeds and desires determine our identity. We sin, so we must be sinners. This is one of the most destructive lives, lies of the evil one. Our identity is in our created nature, not our fallen nature. We were created by God, therefore we're His children. We're redeemed by Jesus, therefore we're His 
possession. We're filled with the Holy Spirit, therefore we're saints. If we can believe what God says about us, we can better behave by the commands He gives us. This is precisely why one of the primary works of the Spirit within us is to convince us we're not who we think we are. You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father, Romans 8, 15. When we hear the Spirit's whisper, we can shout, Abba, Father. When the Spirit is nudging you, you have a Father who loves you, and He's reminding you of that fact. You're looking at St. Bob. And I'm looking at St. Stephen and St. D.T. And, 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 well, I'm not sure about that guy in the back. But anyway, I'm just joking. <laughs> Sorry. Won't call you out. You and I have been given a, a spirit that is confirming within us we are his children. And every time we condemn ourselves, we are allowing Satan to drag us back into a prison of guilt and shame. But you've been delivered from that. You just have to remember that. So, no more condemning. Now led by the Spirit, we are no longer condemned. I want you to repeat with me Romans 8.1. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Sounds like a funeral home. I want to hear the church speak this truth into your life. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. No more condemning. I really believe that when we allow these these recordings to replay in our head or we're allowing Satan to replay them in our head, We'll act more like sinners than the saints that we're declared to be. Pastor Gene Laurie went to visit a support group for men who were struggling with a sex addiction. And so he comes in, the meeting is just getting started. He sits at the back and one man stands up to give his testimony. And as he's talking, he says, last week on my way home, I went by a strip joint and some hands go up and then they go back down. And then the man continues, I stopped and I went inside and some hands go up and then they go back down and the man continues. And then, then he goes, I, I went inside, I did some shameful things, things that I'm, I'm so disgusted about by myself that I did. And I came back out and just sat in my car thinking, how could God love me? And some hands went up and they went back down. After the meeting was over, the pastor went up to the man who was leading the group, and he said, what was going on there? It seemed sort of, you know, I didn't know what was taking place when the man was raising their hands. And so the leader of the group said that we have one rule here, and everybody knows it, that if someone is sharing with something that you struggle with, you must raise your hand. And so every time that guy was talking about something that one of those men, other men had struggled with, they would raise, raise their hand. I hope Cornerstone remains a place of raised hands and not pointing fingers. We got, we got, you know, every time you point a finger, there's four pointing back at you. You know that, right? And so... Whenever we're lifting hands, not just for ourselves, but for others, lifting them up, lifting holy hands to our Father in heaven, asking for help, pleading that we could be transformed. We're going to bring people to Jesus. If I be lifted up, Jesus says, I'll draw all men to myself. So we're lifting up hands, not pointing fingers. There's enough pointing finger places in the world. This is an out-of-the-world place where the Holy Spirit is leading us into a discover a new life and no condemnation. So here's what I want you to do today. I want you to write on a piece of paper every sin 
you keep holding against yourself. And then I want you to burn that paper as a symbol of releasing it to God's grace. It's, I can tell you right now, there's some things I'm going to be writing down today. I want you to write it down, and then I want you to light it on fire, preferably not in the house. <laughs> Lay it outside. Let that smoke rise to the Father in heaven. And maybe you have to do this more than once. Maybe you have to do this over and over again until you finally are convinced that you are no longer condemned for the sin that you have committed. But Jesus Christ has paid the debt you couldn't pay. Let's pray. Father God, I just want to thank you for, I want to thank you for the spirit that lives within me, lives within us. I want to thank you for the spirit that enabled Paul to write this profound chapter, really a hinge point uh, in, our, in, in, in the book of Romans, a, a place where we are just driven to an understanding about how much you love us and that you're not pointing fingers at us, but one man named Jesus lifted hands and gave himself up for us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I pray, Father, for those that might be battling uh, habitual sin. Maybe it's pornography. Maybe it's drug or alcohol addiction. Maybe it's just uh, self-destructive thoughts about how terrible they are. Father, there are a whole host of ways that Satan tries to attack us and destroy our identity in you. Father, I pray that this would be a day, a day of victory, a day where that sin is written on paper and burnt and sent, sent away and that the Spirit of God continues to fill us up. There is no condemnation. Help us to understand the importance of this. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Let me mention a couple other things just before I walk off the stage. We are in the kingdom building business. Today, Cornerstone has participated in helping raise a new church in Virginia Beach. We did that through this organization called Waypoint, where churches partner together to build new churches. This uh, church started about two years ago. They bought a roller rink in Virginia Beach. And uh, they turned it into a daycare center for 18 months. And now they're having their first Sunday worship right now. And because of your gifts and prayer, you're part of that. So we, want, we, we partnered to plant a church today. And we're in the kingdom building business because Jesus is the answer for the whole world. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. Please let us know how this message impacted you by filling out a connect card on our website or app. Consider supporting this ministry by giving online.